Good evening and welcome again to Grim Sporty EPC on YouTube. We're turning today to Matthew's account of the death of Christ, Matthew 27. And we're reading from verse 27 down as far as verse 51. 52, rather. Let us hear the word of God. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took a reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took a robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And now our text. Then behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we're conscious that we're standing on holy ground as we consider the death of your beloved Son. This is the central point in the history of the world. Christ dying for our sins, according to the Scriptures, to be buried and rise again on the third day according to the scriptures. Help us to see the significance of these events mentioned here and help us to see clearly that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and that we're, look to, we're to look to him as he is freely offered to us in the gospel. Grant us the help of your spirit, we pray, in these matters. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last study, we were reminded that the heavens had been dark for three hours. And at the end of that period, our Lord spoke the most mysterious words ever uttered. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That abandonment was the very heart of Calvary because it describes how our Savior experienced the terrors of the Lord and both his body and soul in unrelieved intensity. And in so doing, he completely satisfied the, dem the demands of divine justice so that he could then utter those marvellous words, it is finished, and it could literally be rendered, it is finished and forever stands 
finished. Salvation had been wrought. From that moment onward, we could now speak about the finished word, work of Christ. Now, I cannot be absolutely certain of the order of events at this point, but it seems to me that then nature began to sympathize once more with the goings on at Calvary. Now that salvation had been accomplished, there was no need for the heavens to remain dark, so the sun began to shine. And then our Savior uttered his final words. Verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Luke elaborates on that. Luke 23, verse 46, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now that the abandonment was over, communion was restored. And as Edersheim puts it, the my God of the fourth utterance had again passed unto the Father of conscious fellowship. Notice also, in the last of these so-called seven words, how our Lord controlled his own destiny. And to your hands, he said, I commend my spirit. Our Lord is the only person in the history of the world who has absolute control over the moment of his death. When we die, our lives are taken from us. But when he died, he laid down his life. He committed his spirit to the Father. We are passive in death. He was gloriously active. To use the beautiful words of Hugh Martin, his dying was his grandest doing. So Jesus was dead. The terrible ordeal was over and the lips which spoke so many gracious words were sealed. But although death filled the air and the lips of the Son of God were silent, God the Father was still speaking in a language all his own, the language of miracle. This is a language which is powerful, eloquent and unmistakable. And anyone with any degree of spiritual discernment whatsoever would have realized that miracles taking place at this precise moment meant that God was continuing to say something about the death of his Son. And the three miracles which followed, which we're going to consider now, and what appears to be quick succession, are the miracle of the rent veil, the miracle of the earthquake and the rent rocks, and the miracle of the opening of the tombs and the resurrection, and the appearance of resurrected saints. First of all, the miracle of the rent veil, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Exodus 26 verse 31 provides us with a description of the veil and the tabernacle which played such a significant part in Old Testament worship. Exodus 26 verse 31, you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. There were several veils in that tent of sorts but this was the most significant one. This veil was erected at God's express command and its purpose was to separate the holy place from the most holy place. In the holy place you would have found such items as furniture as the candlestick, table of showbread and the golden altar of incense. But then in the most holy place there was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and it was there that God dwelt in Shekinah glory. And no one was permitted to enter that inner sanctuary with one exception. The high priest could enter just once a year on the Day of Atonement, but not without blood. Had anyone else attempted to do so on any other occasion, he or she would have been struck dead on the spot. Scripture also tells us that the priest had bells on his garments, so presumably worshippers would have heard him walking around the inner sanctuary and they would have known that all was well. So the veil began in the tabernacle. Now later on in the history of redemption, God commanded that a temple be built to take the place of the temporary tabernacle. And once again, there was a separation in that building between the holy place and the most holy. A veil again separated the two compartments. Edersheim tells us what that veil was like in the time of our Lord. This is what he says. The veils before the most holy place were 60 feet long and 20 feet wide of the thickness of the palm of your hand and wrought in 72 squares which were joined together. And these veils were so heavy that in the exaggerated language of the time it needed 300 priests to manipulate each. But at the very moment Christ died, that veil was rent from top to bottom. Notice that little word, then. Then, behold, the veil was rent from top to bottom. Scripture emphasizes the fact that the veil was rent at the very moment Christ died. 
The temple itself remained firm, but the veil was rent from top to bottom. And this was God the Father's way of responding to the cry, it is finished. Speaking anthropomorphically, no sooner had the hands of the Father received Christ's spirit, so to speak, than those same hands took the veil and rent it from top to bottom. The temple would have been full of worshippers at the time because it was Passover. Furthermore, there would have been a large number of priests present who were probably preparing for the evening sacrifice. So these things were not done on a corner. And doubtless the priests knew only too well what was taking place elsewhere in the city. They had already experienced the three hours of darkness which would have unhinged them considerably, but now they witnessed something they would never forget. This massive veil in the temple wasn't rolled up only to be put back in place later on, nor was it rent from the bottom to the top. It was rent from the top to the very bottom. And there is only one message that has been declared here. This is the finger of God. It wasn't partially rent, signifying that something was yet to be done to open up the way into the Holy holy, holy of Holies. There wasn't even a single thread keeping the two sides together. It was rent totally. I wonder how the priests would have reacted to all of this. Would they have fled because they feared that the Lord might suddenly come forth and consume them in a moment? Did they stand in amazement looking at that which was formerly hidden from them, hardly able to believe that they were still alive? Edersham again comments, he says, perhaps this phenomenon accounts for the early conversion of so many priests recorded in Acts 6 verse 7. We're told there that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now we need to ask another, a very obvious question here. What is the significance of this remarkable event? And I want to trace the answer to that question along three lines. First of all, this rent veil made a statement about the person of Christ. The Son of God was now dead, but the miracles were still continuing. The religious authorities assumed that they had now got rid of him. They had hoped that they had seen the last of the miracles which so embarrassed them. But there's a sense in which the miracles were now only beginning. Because God was continuing to say, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This rent veil made a statement about the person of Christ. It also made a statement about the work of Christ. God was now saying that the ceremonial law was abrogated. For centuries, I'm now talking about Old Testament times, God had commanded his people to worship him in a particular way. He had given them certain religious rituals and ceremonies which centered around the tabernacle and the temple. And they constituted the only approach to God. But now in a moment, God brought them all to nothing. Seventy years later, the temple itself would be raised to the ground and that would drive home the point further. But in essence, the point was made right here at the moment of Christ's death. The way into the holies was now open. The reality had now come, so there was no further need of shadows. Christ's once and for all sacrifice for sin had been accomplished and that cancelled out any further need of offerings. Our great high priest had entered the inner sanctuary of heaven itself, so there was no further need of an earthly sanctuary. The shadows were gone and the reality had come. Incidentally, this miracle is an implicit condemnation of Roman Catholicism. The rent veil states clearly that there is no longer any need of priests or offerings to enable us to draw near to God. They were all served a redundancy notice at Calvary because Christ has now appeared to put away sin once and for all by the sacrifice of himself. Tragically, the Roman Catholic Church still perpetuates their priestly caste and the offering of the Mass. The Baltimore Confession, an official document of the Roman Catholic Church, says this, In the new law, there is no other sacrifice acceptable to God save the sacrifice of the Mass. And then it goes on to say, The Mass is the same sacrifice as the sacrifice of the cross, because in the Mass the victim is the same and the principal priest is the same, Jesus Christ. And by making a statement like that, Roman Catholicism attempts to stitch up the veil again. And that is an abomination to God. The rent veil made a statement about the person of Christ. It made a statement about the work of Christ that is complete. Thirdly, it made a statement about our access to God. The way into the holies was now universally open for the first time since Eden. Hebrews 9 verse 8 described the previous state of affairs. The way into the holiness of all was not yet made manifest. 
But then Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 21, describes our present position. What is the present position of believers? Here it is. Therefore, brethren, have bold, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he's consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the privilege every single child of God can enjoy at any time. We have access into God's presence, into the Holy of Holies, through Christ alone. And if you're an unbeliever, the way to God is also clearly set before you hear nothing but Christ and his veil-rending virtue can enable you to draw near to God. There's no place whatsoever here for human merit. You can't open this veil by your good works or your tears or anything else because you see it is already wide open. All you have to do is to plead the merits of Christ who has opened up the way and enter in. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, as is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So that's the first miracle recorded here, the miracle of the rent veil. Secondly, there's the miracle of the earthquake and the rent rocks. Verse 51, then, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split This seismic event took place at the same time as the veil was rent in Jerusalem. So heaven's response to the death of Christ took the form of the earth shaking beneath the feet of those who who lived in the so-called holy city. The crosses probably rocked in their sockets. The rocks were split with the same ease as the veil was rent in the temple. And the entire event was not just felt but seen. Verse 54, so when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Experts tell us that there's still evidence of rent rocks in Jerusalem to this very day. And this was a startling experience indeed. Terra firma is something we normally take for granted. Sometimes we experience shaking in various areas of our lives, relationships, jobs, and health, and so forth. But we don't expect the earth to move. If anything is a symbol of stability and permanence, it is the earth itself. And it must be one of the most unhinging experiences known to man to find the earth to move beneath your feet. But what message is God declaring here? Was this just a meaningless manifestation of power? One of the things that the Jews demanded of our Saviour was a sign, even though they had plenty of evidence already. And our Lord responded to that request by saying, an evil and adulterous generation desires a sign. Signs which have no purpose or significance are not in God's vocabulary. And this miracle had a very definite meaning, which those who had eyes to see it would have understood. In fact, even a pagan Roman soldier saw the significance of it. He didn't dismiss it as a chance event. Rather, he saw it as pointing to the majesty and glory of Christ. He responded to this by saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Tragically, in our day, there is so much brainwashing by science, falsely so-called, that people stifle the voice of God. We're even told that miracles are impossible and that we live in a closed universe. So it's not surprising that even earthquakes and COVID-19 make very little impact. However, God's voice can still penetrate through the rubbish of our sin. And for those steeped in Old Testament teaching, this earthquake would have had very definite connotations. Three in particular. First of all, this miracle, the miracle of the earthquake and rent rocks, speaks of God's covenant mercies. In several places in Scripture, strange as it may seem, an earthquake or the rending of rocks points to God's grace. For instance, when God gave his law, he was acting graciously. He was telling the people whom he had just delivered from bondage how they should live. The Decalogue is introduced as follows. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Here is God's grace. And then he tells them how you should live, how they should live. You should have no other gods before me. And so forth. And this manifestation of grace, the giving of the law, was set in a particular context which is described for us in Exodus 19, verse 16 to 18. 
We're told then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud in the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. A smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Giving of the law was an act of grace and at that time the mountain quaked. Or consider Elijah. God's servant was downcast, disillusioned and depressed. But God restored him and here's part of that activity, 1 Kings 19 verse 11. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. This was a gracious invitation, and it was in the context of an earthquake. And while the message God wanted Elijah to hear was not in the earthquake or in the wind or in the fire, nonetheless, this is how God manifested his grace towards the prophet. The Philippian jailer was converted long after this. But I don't think he would have disagreed with this understanding of things because God's dealings with him and grace began when the earth began to quake under his feet. Here then is one message that has been conveyed here. God was saying that the death of his son was an act of grace. What was happening at Calvary? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and through him we enjoy pardon for our sins, life for hearts of stone, followed by eternity and heaven itself. So that's the first significance of this miracle. It speaks of God's covenant mercies. But it also speaks of God's righteous judgment. Even if scripture didn't have anything to say about this matter, is it not true that if we were caught up in an earthquake or something similar, our natural response would be to cry unto God for mercy. We'd become frightened. We would look upon it as an act of judgment. You see, when things go wrong, conscience works over time. And our natural response is to pray because that's part of our makeup as beings made in the image of God. However, in addition to natural revelation pointing to God's righteous judgment, Scripture also brings these two things together, startling events in the natural realm and God's righteous judgment. And here are just two examples of that, one from the Psalms, the other from the book of Revelation, Psalm 18, verses 6 and 7. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. And now some fearful words from the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and hill was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of his Lamb, of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So here's another message that God was spelling out through the earthquake and the rent rocks. He was declaring that the death of his son was an act of righteous judgment. Satan was judged there. Sin was judged. Death was judged. And that's why believers need never fear. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Paul asked. It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? And here's the reason why. No charge can ever be brought against God's people. It is Christ who died and is risen. Yea, whoever lives and is presently seated at the right hand of God where he makes intercession for us. So as we look at the significance of this miracle, the miracle of the earthquake and rent rocks, in the first place it speaks of God's covenant mercies. In the second place, it speaks of God's righteous judgment. And then in the third place, it speaks of God's cosmic intentions. When the earth began to move just after Christ had committed his spirit into the hands of the Father, surely the connection was clear to all who pondered what was going on. God was saying that the death of his son was intimately bound up with the future of the earth. On what basis can creationists be changed into the new heavens and the new earth? Scripture teaches that the ground of that 
is the death of Christ. Colossians 1 verse 10. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether there be things on earth or things in heaven. So just as sin has a cosmic side to it, it affected the earth. Grace likewise has a cosmic side to it. And this is the third significance of this miracle of earthquake and rent rocks. It speaks of God's cosmic intentions. So we've considered the miracle of the rent veil. We've considered the miracle of the earthquake and rent rocks. And then thirdly, we consider the miracle of the open tombs and resurrected saints. Verses 52 to 53. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. There are three facts recorded here. First of all, the graves were opened. In those days, sepulchres were above the ground and large stones would have covered the entrance to them. And these stones were now rolled away by the power of God, revealing bodies in various stages of decomposition. This may have been an indirect result of the earthquake, although it is unlikely. Earthquakes usually cause things to collapse inward. But here, the movement was outward. And that that implies that we're talking about a separate miracle. Furthermore, while the earthquake affected everything in the vicinity of the cross, perhaps bringing about the collapse of the terrain there, the power of God was directed here, particularly towards the tombs. And furthermore, folk could see it. As mentioned in verse 54, so when the centurion and those who were with them were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened. That's the first fact, the graves were opened. The second fact recorded here is that the saints were raised. We're told many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now it's difficult to know exactly what happened here, but taking this in conjunction with verse 53, this is what I think happened. In verse 53 we're told that these bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city. So it seems what happened here is this. At the moment Christ died, the tombs were opened. However, it appears that the bodies lay there until the resurrection. So between Friday and Sunday, it seemed that there were open tombs in a cemetery in Jerusalem with their contents exposed. Therefore, the inhabitants of the city were held in a state of suspense for two days without anything else happening. Then on Sunday, on the day of the resurrection, the saints arose. It's also possible that we're even meant to distinguish between the opening of all the graves and the raising of the saints alone. If that's what happened, it would certainly have given the leaders in Jerusalem something to think about. The people who had murdered Christ were now faced with the solemn fact that God had raised those who had followed Christ, but not others. Now obviously there's much that is mysterious about this incident and it raises many questions. More questions than answers in fact. Did these people have resurrection bodies? And the answer is, I don't know. Did they continue to live on like Lazarus, who was raised from the dead and then die later on? Or were they taken up to heaven at the time our Lord returned? Again, I don't know. And who were these people who were raised? Once again, we don't know. Certainly the dust of many whom the Lord would have been pleased to honor lay close by. Because David was buried close by. Solomon, Jehoshaphat and others. And in more recent times, perhaps folk like Mary and Zacharias and Simeon and Anna. And Anna were possibly buried here too. All of these matters are surrounded in mystery. But one thing is sure, there were no unbelievers present among those who were raised. The text says quite distinctly, the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And then the third fact that we're told here is that the people were visited. Coming out of the graves at the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now I realize that folk can scoff at this incident and say that it sounds more like a horror movie than reality, but this is not fiction. What Matthew records here really did happen. Uncles, aunts, grannies and grandpas who had died in the Lord in a past day appeared to relatives. And it's quite possible that they appeared to unbelievers as well. We're told they appeared to many. And that word money is vague, so it could apply to both believers and unbelievers. We know that our Lord appeared only to believers, 
but it seemed that these people appeared to all on sundry. So unbelievers may well have met some of these resurrected saints, and it wouldn't have taken long for the penny to drop that there were no unbelievers among them. Only the saints were raised. Now what's the message of this miracle? Surely it is this. Heaven was declaring that the Son of God is the head of a new humanity. So it were as in Adam all die, and Christ all are made alive. And even here there is proof that through his resurrection, Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. You see, he has come that we might have life. And both body and soul. And that forevermore. Krumacher makes this interesting comment about this miracle. He says, that which God intended by this miracle is sufficiently evident. The powerful effects of Christ's vicarious death reach down even to the domains of the dead. By the offering up of his, one, of his own life, he became prince of life. Even in the appalling regions of corruption, he over the, overthrew the throne of him who, according to the scriptures, had the power over death. And he acquired the authority not only to conduct the souls he had redeemed to the mansions of eternal peace, but also to wrest their bodies from the bonds of the curse. And in due time to present his people to the Father in bodily as well as spiritual glorification. This truth the Almighty intended primarily to confirm by the miracle of the opening of the graves connected with the death of Christ. And then by the actual resurrection of the bodies of the saints on the third day. Three miracles, the miracle of the rent veil, the miracle of the earthquake and rent rocks, the miracle of the open tombs and resurrection since. And we could summarize the significance of all these miracles in the words of 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Friends, there is virtue in the death and resurrection of Christ because the response of heaven to Christ's death was to raise up others in life. The message is surely clear. Christ's death was not for himself, but for others. And those who believe in him enjoy life in both body and soul, and that forevermore. As Christ himself said, I have come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. And it begins in the here and now with the life of God and the soul of man, and then it continues in the hereafter as well. This is the portion of all who trust in Christ alone for salvation. Amen.